We are live, everyone. So my name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And today, we continue our epic little series that we've been doing with Environment and Climate Change Canada. There have been some really fantastic presentations on Indigenous community monitoring of wildlife regions. We've done the mysteries of air pollution. And today, we are doing, again, what is one of the most popular sign-up presentations we've ever had in the history of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants on the Monarch Butterfly Migration. So Greg Mitchell's joining us. He's in the Wildlife Research Division of Environment and Climate Change Canada, and he's the Canadian co-chair of this tri-national you know, science partnership between Mexico, the U.S., and Canada, tracking and understanding the monarch butterfly migration. Um, certainly uh, living here in Toronto, it's always exciting seeing them every year, and I'm sure wherever you're joining from across Canada or the U.S., uh, you feel the same way. So I'm looking so very forward to hearing from uh, Greg, and let's dive right in and, and take us away. Go for it. Thanks so much for joining. Perfect. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining today. Um, it means a lot to me. Um, happy Canadian Environment Week. Happy United Nations uh, Environment Day. And uh, before I started my talk, I just wanted to acknowledge um, that I'm, I'm giving this presentation um, from, from Ottawa, and, and it's the, um, it's the um, traditional and unceded uh, territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe uh, people. So, um, yeah, so my name is Greg Mitchell. I work for the Wildlife Research Division of uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada. And I work at the National Wildlife Research Center um, here in Ottawa and it's on Carleton University's campus. And I'm just going to queue up my presentation here. So just bear with me for one second. While you're doing that, we'll admire the beautiful monarchs that are behind you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Can everybody see that okay? You can see that, Jesse? Yep, yeah, you're good to okay. go. Great. So um, I have what I honestly believe to be one of the best jobs in the world, and that is to um, work to understand and protect Canada's wildlife and um, our species at risk, including the monarch butterfly. Um, and uh, I get to do this through research and science. So one of my most important jobs working for the government is working with my colleagues and friends in the Mexican government and the United States government to help protect and conserve uh, the monarch butterfly. And we do this through something we created called the Tri-National Monarch Conservation and Science Partnership. And basically we work together to identify what we call knowledge gaps or information that we're missing that we think we need to effectively help the monarch butterfly, to, to conserve the monarch butterfly. And we get together and we identify these gaps in our knowledge, what we don't know, what we think we need to know, and we think about ways that we can help fill those information gaps and we execute them, um, we, we carry them out. So um, another thing, I, I, I get to work with this really cool organization called the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. And this organization works for our three governments. Um, and they work on shared environmental priorities and concerns and issues. And one of the things that they're really, really good at, really, really effective at is bringing uh, people together. They do a lot of things really well, but one of the things that I, I appreciate the most is they bring people together to work on these uh, priorities, these environmental priorities. And that can be community members, that can be uh, scientists, it can be uh, government officials, but they get everybody in the same room, whether it's remotely through virtual conferences or physically together. And we work together to solve these problems. And this picture I have here is a picture from a Commission for Environmental Cooperation project that we had on uh, monarch butterflies. This picture is from Mexico, just at the bottom of uh, one of the wintering colonies. And uh, it was a project where we brought together scientists from all across Mexico, the US and Canada that were wor interested in working on monarch conservation. And we discussed ways that we could uh, better work together and um, help conserve the monarch butterfly. Um, so the monarch butterfly for me, it's something incredibly special. Um, I, I call it something that's our, it's, it's part of our shared natural heritage between our three countries. Um, it, it's a symbol of, of hope and collaboration and friendship for me. 
it's something, it's, it's, it's a tiny organism, but it links our three countries together. And um, it brings a smile to my face. It brings a smile to my, my colleagues in Mexico and, and my friends in the US all in the same way. So it's something that, that um, I like to, to, to think about um, and, and um, it's, it's part of what motivates me to help conserve and protect the monarch butterflies is the way that it, it really connects us together. So um, I thought before I get into some of the details of my talk today, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about the amazing monarch butterfly migration. I'm, I'm going to discuss um, the ways that we count monarch butterflies and why we need to count them. And I'm gonna talk about some of the research that we're doing up here in Canada to help uh, protect and conserve the monarch butterfly. But I thought to get things started, we, we'd start with a couple quizzes. Don't worry, I'm not taking notes and who's getting things right and wrong. Um, but what I have here is two pictures of, of butterflies. One's a monarch butterfly and, and one's uh, something that we call a mimic. So it looks like a monarch butterfly. It's a viceroy butterfly. And um, what I'd like you to do, if, if you don't already know, is take a guess. Which one's the monarch butterfly and which one's the viceroy? I'll just give you a couple seconds to think about it or to take a guess if you don't, don't already know. All right, so if you guessed that the picture on the left is the viceroy, you're correct, and the picture on the right is the monarch. They look very, very similar, and there's a reason for that. I'll explain that a little bit later. But the easiest way to tell them apart is if you look at the hind wings or the back wings of the viceroy, so the image on the left, uh, you can see that what almost looks like a smiley mouth, a line that goes across the bottom of the hind wings. And that's how I tell them apart. The monarch butterfly, the picture on the right, it doesn't have that smiley face. Okay, so our second quiz is these are both pictures of monarch butterflies. One of them is a male or a boy butterfly. One of them is a female or a girl butterfly. And I'd like you, if you don't already know, to take a guess at which one's the male and which one's the female. I'll just give you a couple more seconds here. All right, perfect. If you guess the image on the left was the female, uh, you're correct. And the image on the right is the male. And the easiest way to tell them apart, the easiest field sign that we, what we like to refer to them as, is the male has these two dark spots on its hind wings or its back wings, and I've circled them here in white. The female doesn't have those um, dark spots in the bottom of her wing. The other thing, that, the other um, characteristic uh, field sign that we can use is that the, the veins, those dark lines running across the orange of the monarch wing, they're much uh, thinner on the males than they are on the females. So you can see the thicker black webbing or veins on the image on the left as opposed to the, the image on the right. So that's how we tell them apart. Okay, so my absolute favorite thing about the monarch butterfly is its incredible migration. And I have a little animation here that, I, that I've made. And this is a butterfly. Let's just pretend that it, it, it originated. It, so it, it developed in Canada. It was an egg and then a caterpillar and a butter, butterfly and it emerged. And it was mid-October, late October, and, or sorry, mid-August, late August, and it's time to migrate. So this butterfly is going to leave Canada Southwest Ontario, it's going to fly all through the United States and all through um, northeastern Mexico to central Mexico to where it spends the winter in the mountains, about 150 kilometers west of, of Mexico City. That's incredible. So from Canada, that can be up to like approximately 4,000 kilometers. And to put this in perspective, this butterfly, uh, the average weight of a monarch butterfly is about 0 0.5 grams. So a $5 bill, for example, in Canada weighs one gram, almost one gram. And so something that, that weighs half as much as a $5 bill is able to migrate and fly all the way from Canada through the United States down into Mexico. It's just incredible to me. Um, another way to think about it is that a penny uh, weighs about 2.5 grams. So something that's about one fifth uh, the mass of a, of a penny is able to fly all the way down to Mexico. Um, and, and return to the same mountains year after year. It's, it's just mind blowing. Um, but the other thing that's really, really interesting about the monarch migration is that it's multi-generational. And so what happens is that the monarch from Canada would fly all the way down to Mexico and it would spend the winter there. And then it would start migrating uh, north again in the spring and it would lay its eggs 
And that monarch's gonna die shortly after, but its eggs are gonna develop into caterpillars and monarchs. And then that generation's gonna migrate north and they're gonna die, but then they're gonna have laid eggs before they die. And those are gonna develop into caterpillars and monarchs, and they're gonna continue to migrate north. And so we might see four or five of these generations um, making their way in waves across the US during the breeding season. Um, that's just incredible to me. And so another way to think about this is that we might have seen a monarch butterfly. I'm just gonna use Canada as an example. We might have seen a monarch butterfly in Canada uh, the year before. So I saw one last summer and I might see a monarch this summer. I, I will see a monarch, I'll go looking for them. But the monarch that I see this summer might be the, the great, great grandchild or the great, great, great grandchild of the monarch uh, that I saw the summer before. And so these butterflies that are being produced through these subsequent generations, they've never migrated to Mexico before, but somehow they know how to get back there to the same general locations year after year. It's really incredible having never done it before. Um, I have two pictures here on the right. One's a caterpillar, uh, monarch caterpillar that I, I, I took this picture um, along the north shore of Lake Erie in Ontario um, in the summer. And then I have a picture of a monarch butterfly that I, I took on the wintering grounds in Mexico. And I'd like to think in my head that uh, it's the same individual. It's probably wishful thinking, but uh, we can all dream, right? Okay, so another really cool thing about the monarch butterfly is that it only lays eggs on a specific genus of plant. And, and that's the, the, the milkweed plant. And they only lay eggs on milkweed. And the reason they do this is that there's a toxin. It's actually a heart toxin in um, the sap of the milkweed plant. And so that sap is poisonous to you and me and other mammals and, and other birds. It's not poisonous to the monarch. So as the monarch's eating the milkweed and developing on the milkweed, um, as a caterpillar, it's incorporating this poison into its tissues. And then eventually when it forms a butterfly, it has those toxins um, in its tissues as a butterfly. And that orange that we see, that beautiful orange of the monarch, it's actually a symbol to um, potential predators, things that might try to eat a monarch that, hey, I don't taste good and I'm poisonous. And um, that's one of the reasons why we have a mimic, the Viceroy, is because it, um, through evolution, uh, there was selection for it to have similar coloring as the monarch and similar, similar pattern, like a similar pattern on the wings, um, so that predators would um, avoid it. They wouldn't eat it because they think it tastes bad. So it doesn't actually, the, the viceroy doesn't actually develop on milkweed like the, like the monarchs, but, and it, so it doesn't taste as bad and it's not poisonous. Um, but predators tend to avoid it because it looks like the monarch. We have in Canada, we have, um, I think 13 species of, of milkweed that are, that are currently uh, in the country. And uh, one of them was in Southwest, we had a 14th that was in Southwestern Ontario, but it's been extirpated. That means um, it's no longer found in, in uh, this part of, of the country. So this is the third image from the previous slide. And I, I just wanted to um, zoom in here a little bit. And what you can see is a baby monarch caterpillar eating the milkweed leaf. And then I've circled this white dot or speck and that's a monarch egg. They're really, really, really small. So when I'm out looking for um, monarch eggs uh, and monarch caterpillars, I gently grab the edge of the leaf and I look on the, other, on the underside of, of the um, milkweed leaf and that's usually where you can see some eggs and um, uh, caterpillars. And, and here in Canada, the best time for, for looking for this is probably mid-July through mid-August. Here's a video I took of a, of a, a, a caterpillar eating a leaf. Um, as you can see, it's, it has a huge appetite. So this is a caterpillar that's probably getting pretty close to going into its uh, chrysalis. And so people ask me, like, how long does it take a, a monarch to develop? Well, the egg stage, it all depends on temperature because monarchs and insects are ectotherms. And so the outside temperature affects their metabolism, how quickly they move and 
how quickly they digest things and develop. And so an egg usually, the egg stage usually lasts two to five days. And then the caterpillar uh, comes out and it just starts eating right away. And um, the caterpillar stage can last anywhere from eight days to maybe two weeks, uh, depending on temperature again. And during that time, they're increasing their body weight by 2000 times. So they're just eating all the time and they're growing and then they'll go into their chrysalis. And this stage lasts about two weeks again, uh, on average, uh, before they emerge as the beautiful monarch butterflies. So about 30 days. So I've been really, really fortunate um, uh, in my position working with the, the Tri-National Monarch Conservation Science Partnership to be able to take two trips down to the wintering grounds in Mexico to two different wintering colonies. Um, and it's bar none, the, the most incredible natural history experience I've, I've ever had in my life. I can't even put it into words how special and amazing it is. And if people ever have the opportunity and the means to visit these colonies in Mexico, I encourage everybody to go down and, and, and visit these colonies at a safe distance um, and, and, um, and just experience how beautiful it is. And, and how incredible and unique it is. And it also serves another purpose. It really supports the local communities that are working hard down there to conserve and protect the monarchs. By going down there and, for example, hiring a guide and, and getting admission to one of the protected areas. Um, and it really doesn't cost very much money at all. Um, you're supporting the local economy and we're encouraging um, stewardship and protection and conservation of monarchs. So. They cluster around trees. Sometimes you find them on rocks. They hang in these big clumps, those big brown clumps in the top right image. Those are clumps of butterflies just hanging off the branches. They're physically bending the branches down. There's so many monarchs. It's just incredible. And the average elevation of these colonies, it's about 2,600 meters to 3,400 meters. Um, and to put that in perspective, uh, if you're familiar with the CN Tower in Toronto, how tall that is, if you can picture the CN Tower, that's almost six CN Towers stacked on top of each other. And so it's very, 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 very high. And the reason they like to be high up in the mountains, the reason they like to be high up in the mountains is because um, they, it's, it's cooler uh, at those high altitudes. Again, they're ectotherms. And so by spending their, their, um, by spending their winters high up in, in these mountains, they're keeping their body temperature down. And that means they don't have to eat. In fact, they don't eat while they're sp spending their time up on these mountains. They, they do wake up occasionally to drink and to hydrate to get some water, but we think they get most of their energy. They get it from nectar as they're migrating and probably especially at the, during the last stages of their migration. So they get all that sugary nectar water from flowers and they turn it into fat and then they, they live off that fat all winter. So here is a short video I'm going to show that I took from my first visit to a colony and this is late in the wintering season. So these monarch butterflies are starting to move down the mountain. They're getting ready to migrate and this is when the sun comes out and they're starting to warm up. This is really early in the morning. And these butterflies are beginning to fly around. Some of them are probably going to go um, look for a place to drink some water. And it was just incredible. I, I couldn't even put that experience into words. I'm going to pause it here. And all those dark clumps that you see up in the trees, those are monarch butterflies. And my question to you is, can you take a guess or count how many monarch butterflies are there? It's really, really difficult. I wasn't expecting anybody to come up with an answer. It is challenging. And so how do we count monarch butterflies? And I should have mentioned earlier in my talk, I'm, I'm largely focused on the Eastern migratory population of monarch butterflies, Western monarch population of butterflies that winters along the coast of California and, and moves inland and north and into British Columbia and Canada, for example. And both populations, they're both in trouble. I'll talk about this a little bit later. They're both seeing serious declines. Um, the populations are going down and we think that it's the same things that are affecting both populations just in different areas. Um, so on the West Coast, there's fewer monarch butterflies. And so they tend to actually, they, they try to count them and estimate how many there are. But in Mexico, there's just too many to do that. 
So the question is, how do we count monarch butterflies in Mexico, given the challenges? Well, our colleagues in the Mexican government at CONAMP, so this is equivalent to Parks Canada, um, they actually trace a perimeter around all the individual colonies. So this past year, uh, I think there was 11 colonies uh, that were documented, documented by CONAMP. Uh, six of them were in um, what we call the Monarch Butterfly Reserve. It's a UN uh, World uh, Natural Heritage Site. And um, what, what they do is they trace a perimeter uh, around the colonies. So they go kind of tree to tree to tree. And it's the area that's occupied by those monarchs um, that is used to kind of estimate the population size or to quantify the population size. And they do this a couple times a year. And so by adding up all these areas of the individual colonies, we get an idea of how healthy or unhealthy the population is. Um, but what I wanted to show you was some cool um, um, new technology and approaches to trying to count monarchs that um, was initially started by the Mexican government and, and my colleagues in, in the US, um, but which we supported uh, through a Commission for Environmental Cooperation project um, more recently. And uh, the, the, the team lead here was Dr. Uh, Nick Histrov, and I, he used a technique called LIDAR. And this is light uh, distancing and, and ranging. And basically it's a laser and there's a whole bunch of lasers and he's shooting lasers off uh, the vegetation and that light energy or laser energy is reflected back and he's able to recreate 3D images or compositions of the environment based on these um, reflections from the lasers. And so here's an example of a um, a, a video that he made based on LIDAR. So this is an actual um, video as, we're, as we traditionally know. This is based on the laser light having been reflected off. These are monarchs that we're looking at right now hanging off the trees. And um, you can see all the other trees that don't have monarchs that are also reflecting that, that energy. And so by um, taking these LIDAR images uh, Nick is able to create or, or have, um, uh, he's able to recreate or have images that we can use to quantify monarchs. I'm just going to explain this in a little bit more detail because I think it's pretty cool. I have a link here to a video that Nick uh, and his team made that explains kind of their, their reasoning for doing this in a little more detail. It's really accessible and I think it's a great video. I think everybody should check it out. There's a link here. Um, but here is another video from Nick. And what they've done is he went down with his team when the monarchs, so this is just one tree that has monarchs. They went down in the winter and they did the LiDAR imagery. What they do is they turn that into a mesh of a whole bunch of polygons. So they have a shape of the monarchs. Then they go back down when the monarchs aren't there and they shoot a similar video. I'm just freezing up a little bit here, guys. So I apologize for that. So they do take a video when there's monarchs there. They take a video, video when there's monarchs not there. And then they create a similar, um, let me just see if I can start that over here for you. I'll just start it here. Okay, so that's the image, kind of a volumetric estimate that they use with the lasers of, of monarchs. And they go back when there's no monarchs, they measure the same tree and they create a volumetric estimate. So how much space is that tree occupying? How much space were the monarchs occupying? He puts it together and then he subtracts the tree from the monarchs. And so what we're left of with in the end is an area occupied by monarchs on this tree on the wintering grounds. And what Nick and his team are doing right now um, and, and partners within the USGS are trying to take this kind of volumetric estimate the space that's occupied by monarch butterflies and they're trying to turn it into a number of butterflies and I think they're very close. So this is very exciting research. So why do we need to count monarchs? The reason we need to count anything is because we need to understand uh, how the populations are doing. How healthy are the populations? Are they in trouble? So the Mexican government along with the World uh, Wildlife Fund um, and other partners began uh, counting the area occupied by monarchs in the mid-1990s, and they've continued through to this day. 
And this is the only kind of graph I'm gonna show during this presentation, but what you can see is that the number of monarchs and the area occupied by monarchs, it's declining through time. And this amounts to about an 80% decline in monarchs. And it's, it's a bit alarming. And I think the decline on the West Coast, the Western population, it's even stronger. So we need to take conservation action now. This past winter, the uh, monarchs occupied 2.83 hectares. And you're probably thinking, what the heck is, what does 2.83 hectares mean? Like, what, how can I visualize that? So to put it into context, um, I have some car cartoon drawings here of track and field tracks. And um, these are maybe, <clears throat> picture Olympic sized track and field tra track. The inside area of that track is about 1.12 hectares in area. So this past winter, all of the Eastern migratory population of monarchs um, that survived the flight down to Mexico, they were contained within a total area that was just under three track and field tracks. So that's not a lot of space that they're occupying on the wintering grounds. And why is this important? And this goes for the Western population too, that's also uh, very low right now. Why do we care? It's because something that scientists refer to as stochastic events, but another way to, another term that's you know much more friendly is random events. And so a chance winter storm could come through when the population is this small and really do a lot of harm to the remaining individuals and possibly do so much harm that that population can never recover. And so here's an example. There was a storm in 2002 that was uh, estimated to have, have killed about 80% of the wintering population in Mexico. So if a population gets too small and we have these chance events that we can't control like weather, um, then it can really have a big impact on the population. And so scientists, uh, we think we need a population that's at the very minimum six, it occupies an area of six of those track and field tracks in order to buffer against some of these random events, weather events that can happen, but even more would be better. Okay, I'm gonna shift gears here and I'm just gonna talk about some of my research uh, or some of the research that I'm involved with uh, here in Canada. And there's a couple of things I just want you guys to take away from this. We rely so heavily on what I call community science and others refer to as citizen science data. Um, there's just, monarchs are so widespread and diffuse and milkweed that they need is so widespread and diffuse that it's impossible for science scientists at, at different research institutions to be everywhere to count and monitor milkweed and monarchs or even any a lot of these other widespread species. And so um, what we need is we rely on this community science data. And so Amon is a PhD student from Iran that I'm, I'm working with at Carleton University. And what he did is he used freely available citizen science or community science data from, from the program Journey North. So these are observations of, of monarchs. And this is a map of, of North America here. Um, both panels are using slightly different methods. You don't need to worry. They, they both basically tell the same stories. You can just focus on the top one if you'd like. And um, what we did is we controlled for the population density in each of these uh, cells. So we know that when, where there's more people, there's more monarch observations because there's more eyes looking. And so we tried to control for that or account for that. And just to put it in perspective, uh, what we came up with, our, our best estimate is that approximately kind of 12 to 17 percent of the monarch, the migratory monarch population. So these are observations that were taken and submitted by you and me and our neighbors to Journey North right uh, before the monarch migration starts. So about 12 to 17 percent of those monarch observations or the monarch population we think is starting in Canada. But we can do this for any region in the US or Canada. And the reason this is so important, why do we need to know where monarchs are coming from before they start their migration is because it helps us identify where we need to invest in conservation efforts. We need to know where we need to be putting the work in, whether it's maybe a hotspot that supports a lot of monarchs right now, or maybe we want to continue doing what we're doing there or we try to even increase numbers there. And there might be low spots that should be hot spots, you know, spots where we don't see a lot of monarchs, but there should be a lot of monarchs. And maybe we can um, do some conservation work there to increase their, their numbers. So that's one way that we tell where monarchs are coming from. Another way, which I think is really, really cool, is uh, something called stable isotopes. So, this is a chemical signature in the monarch's 
wings. And so um, those chemical signatures are unique to where uh, the monarch developed as a caterpillar. And so it has to do with groundwater. So the unique chemical signature in the groundwater across North America gets incorporated into the milkweed plant, then incorporated into the caterpillar, and then eventually incorporated into the butterfly wings. Those same unique chemical signatures are incorporated into our hair as well and our nails. Um, but what we can do is we can go down to Mexico in the winter and we can take some, we can find some dead butterflies that are at the bottoms of trees and we can measure the isotope signatures, that chemical signature in the wing, and we can guesstimate where in um, the US and Canada that monarch came from. I think this is really cool. And what we see, it, it, it tells the same story that Amon's approach in the previous slide uh, showed. And a lot of this work was, was led by a colleague, Dr. Uh, Flockhart. Dr. Tyler Flockhart. And, you know, approximately in Canada, maybe 15% uh, percent of the um, monarchs that we see in Mexico seem to be originating uh, from Canada, just for example. So, and we've gone back and we've repeated this effort now with the Mexican government and the US government, and we've taken much, many, 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 many more samples. And so we're gonna be able to update this, this map with, with much um, better data or much more data. Okay, another cool project that I'm involved with is, um, it was with an honor student, her name's Diana. And this was at Carleton University and it relied on the community science and citizen science again. And um, so just for people that don't know, when you're at college or university, uh, you can work with professors at, at those universities to get course credits. And so Diana approached me and she wanted to um, get a course credit for what we call an honors thesis. And she wanted to study uh, monarch butterflies. She actually worked on, on monarchs and the monarch way stations um, for um, some parks in the US. And she, she had an interest in monarchs. And so what we did is we used the iNaturalist website and uh, the Mission Monarch website. Um, and we took all of the photographs that people had uploaded of monarchs uh, nectaring on flowers. And these three examples are all monarchs nectaring on, on milkweed, um, but there's lots of other flowers. This happened to be the most common type of picture that we saw. I just randomly selected these. These are actually from iNaturalist. <clears throat> and we identified all of the flowers that monarchs were using in turn, and also if they're natural, uh, if they're invasive, if, if they're cultivated. And so we get a picture now of what flowers monarchs might be uh, preferentially um, seeking out to nectar on during uh, the breeding season and also during the migration season. So um, this research is going to come out shortly. We're, we're just putting some finishing touches on it, but it was a really cool experience. Again, completely dependent on citizen science data, and community science data. Um, another thing that we wanted to know is um, how are monarch populations in Canada doing? And again, I'm just mentioning this, I'm not gonna get into the details, but we worked, uh, worked with a partner, Dr. Tara Crew, um, and also uh, Dr. Maxime Larivet from the Montreal Insectarium. And we took um, um, observations of monarchs from eButterfly, which is a community citizen science app. And um, a lot of those were submitted by the Toronto Entomologists Association through their Ontario Butterfly Atlas. And we were able to use all these observations that these people submitted to develop population indices for, um, so we were able to look at how the monarch population increased and decreased through time every year uh, to see how it's doing. And we did this for all the butterflies that occupy similar habitats as the monarch. So there's four other migratory species here and um, a bunch of what we call resident species. So these are species that don't migrate outside of Canada. They overwinter um, um, in, their, in their chrysalis uh, here in, um, uh, in Canada. So um, there's a lot of cool details that came out of that study and I'm happy to talk about them some more. But again, I just wanted to stress and emphasize this is because of folks like you contributing this data. It wouldn't be possible without you. Um, another thing I've been working on is trying to count how many milkweed stems we have in Canada. And um, it's again, it's really hard and time consuming to survey. And this is just an image of Ontario and some of our estimates of, of milkweed stems um, kind of per hectare. And don't pay too much attention to the numbers here. This is uh, from an earlier kind of iteration of the study and we've refined it since. But 
basically, um, we just went to the literature wherever somebody had published information about how much milkweed you find in different kinds of habitats. So whether it's agricultural lands or riversides or parks or cities. And then we estimated um, just using land cover images, remotely sensed imagery in GIS, how many milkweed stems there are across Canada. And the thing, the reason I'm showing you this is that there's a lot of variability. There's huge variability in the number of stems that we think there are. And so what, this is my plea to, to you folks, um, and this goes for Canada and the US. We need people out there counting milkweed stems for us and monitoring eggs and, and larvae. And um, this will help make these types of, of maps better. And the reason we need to know how many milkweed stems we have is because, again, this is the only plant the monarchs uh, breed on. And we think that each monarch needs about 30 milkweed stems to successfully replace itself. So out of all the eggs that it lays um, on different um, milkweed um, plants, only um, kind of about one in 30 will make it to the, the adult uh, life stage. Okay, so how can you help? Lots of ways, really simple. In Canada, we use something called Mission Monarch. Um, this is, you can use the website. There's an app coming out. I've used this for the past several years. And you just go and count monarchs, count milkweed plants. You can look under the leaf of the milkweed plants and count eggs. And there's similar programs in the US. Um, you can um, look at the, the Monarch Joint Venture website, for example. Uh, for information and we communicate we we, we uh, are working with them as partners and so our monitoring programs in Canada are very similar um, if not quite identical but if very close to identical as the ones in the US and so the reason that's important the reason that we do that coordination is so that we can all be collecting similar data to get a more complete picture of, of monarchs and how the populations are doing through time so in Canada we do mission monarch this was developed by the Montreal Insectarium, um, as, well, as well by the Canadian Wildlife Service, which is part of Environment and Climate Change Canada. And I invite everybody this year, and we do this every year, and the, the participation has been growing exponentially, is participate in our Monarch Blitz. And so this is a one-week period every year that, that community members in Mexico, the US, and Canada, we all go out during the same week and we count eggs and caterpillars and butterflies all during the same week. And we get a snapshot of how well the monarch population is doing across all of North America. And this is a really good outreach tool. It gets people outside. Um, you don't have to do a lot. You can do as much as you want. Um, there's different levels of participation. You can, you can just count stems. You can try to count eggs. You can look at other flowers. And so there's lots of different ways to participate. And I encourage everybody to do so. OK, this is a, I'm, I'm just about finished here. Um, here's 10 things that, that you, everyone can do to help protect monarchs and, and pollinators in general. And um, I have a, a link here. And this is produced by the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. There's also a really amazing and touching video uh, that goes along with this. So I encourage everybody to check it out. But I really wanted to focus on the first four uh, points. So things that we can do, you and I, to help protect and conserve monarch butterflies. One is to create and preserve monarch habitat. And the second one is to plant milkweed and nectar plants native to your area. So we can do both of these things on our balconies of our apartments. Um, we can do this in our yards. Um, we can encourage our um, government representatives to do this. And it's important to, to use native milkweed plants and nectar plants because um, especially if you, there's been a lot of research and studies that have come out recently that have, that have shown that, um, that native pollinators, it's almost like they're more, they are, they're more familiar with these native plants and they tend to do better. And that goes right up the food chain. So birds in areas where there's native plants tend to do better, they tend to be healthier. And so we wanna make sure that we're um, planting native plants. And so a good example here is milkweed. We wouldn't want to plant tropical milkweed in Canada because that plant lives a little bit longer into the fall. And what it can do is it can kind of trick the monarch into um, laying eggs when it should be migrating because that plant's still alive. Whereas all the other native uh, milkweed plants in this area would have already senesced or, or died away. Um, educate others about monarchs. Talk to your friends, talk to your parents, talk to your teachers. 
Um, and let's get everybody on board here. And the last thing um, that I encourage everybody to do is join these citizen science efforts to monitor monarch butterflies, but pollinators in general and, and other species. We literally could not do the research and the work that we're doing without your help. And um, I just wanted to say a big thank you to everybody that contributes to these efforts. So on that, I'd like to um, thank everybody for their attention. I, I'd love to take any questions. I think that went a little bit longer than, than we anticipated, but I'm also willing to stay as long as, as possible. Um, I might not have all the answers, but I most definitely, um, uh, well, that's actually you know, the, the, the best part about, about um, science is, is uh, constantly learning new things. So um, I'm really excited to field your questions. And again, thank you so much for, for tuning in today. Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much, Greg. So I have some good news and I have bad news, everyone. Um, good news is huge support online. We had over 100 people watching. Uh, we had people from Geez, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Quebec, Ontario, and Manitoba. So people from all over Canada, the States, a huge mix of amateurs and people that are involved in Monarch organizations. It was so nice to see support from groups that are involved in Mission Monarch, that are in Point Pele and working on Monarch conservation. So a huge shout out to all of you. The bad news is, is that you were, you, you covered so much ground that we, we don't have too, too much time for questions. So what I want to do is take some live questions from our groups. And then I have a quick question for you, Greg. Are we able to share that presentation out to our email list of groups that signed up? Because uh, a few of them, certainly with iPhones and stuff, weren't able to see some of the more uh, intricate stuff. And we'd love to be able to share that info. Can you share that with us? Oh, absolutely. 100%. Perfect. So once you give that to us, we'll send that to the entire our email list of groups that signed up for this presentation. We, we look forward to getting that to you soon. And in the YouTube chat bar, I've been linking to a lot of the presentations and take action links that Greg's been mentioning. All right, with that said, let's go to our live groups. So Ms. Mass joining us uh, in uh, Emeryville, Ontario. If you have a question for us, uh, you're demuted and come on up. Mm, yes, we have a question. Um, here in Southwestern Ontario, of course, we're um, in Emeryville. We're not very far from Point Pelee, which is one of the main monarch migration sites. And um, we were wondering, with the constant change in our warm weather, we often are very warm now until the end of October even, has that been causing a delay or that mimic effect that you were talking about uh, with some of the monarch butterflies leaving our area there for a little bit later? Okay, thank you so much for the question. That's a great question. And um, I actually had another honors student uh, this year, um, working on on that exact question and so uh, we started with data there's good there's great there's amazing data from from Peely um, and we started with data from Long Point actually uh, on the north uh, side of Lake Erie and what we're we didn't we didn't see a change so through time we're not seeing a change in like the average migration date um, so it tends to happen around the same time every year, but we are seeing an increase in, in variability around that date. So the tails are kind of getting longer. And so your observation with, you know, slightly warmer weather, um, it does seem to be having an effect on um, monarchs sticking around for a little bit longer. And so one of the, it, it's a really good question. And, and one of the things that I think we need to tease apart, you know, the devil's always in the details is um, that we don't necessarily know if these, uh, that observation of us seeing more monarchs later in the season is eggs that just wouldn't have survived in the past because it got too cold too quickly, um, or if it's actually kind of um, tricking the monarchs into breeding later in the season. And um, it, it, one thing that this is observational, um, but one thing that we did notice this last year is you probably noticed you saw a lot, I, I imagine you probably saw a lot of monarchs the previous summer. Um, we we definitely saw a lot of monarchs in, in different parts of um, uh, like it, around Ottawa here and also on Lake Erie. I, I did, and uh, that didn't translate. Usually, that translates to a lot of monarchs on the wintering grounds. And it didn't translate this year. So on average, when we have more monarchs in Canada, we tend to see more monarchs on the wintering grounds in Mexico. And I think that's just because if there's a lot of monarchs in Canada, um, there's probably a lot of monarchs everywhere else. Uh, it was just a good breeding season. 
And um, so we, we tend to see uh, more tend to make it down to Mexico. Yeah. And uh, we had a, a disconnect this year. And I think what happened was uh, we did see a lot of uh, monarchs because the weather was a bit nicer this past fall initially. Uh, but then I think there was a hard stop and the weather turned very quickly uh, to the fall. And so even though we thought we were going to have this great year, um, I think a lot of monarchs probably perished during migration because of that, that uh, really cool fall. Uh, great answer. And something that we, we cover in a lot of our presentations is that, you know, whether it's specific instances or specific storms, climate changing in general is causing a lot of uh, difficulties for a lot of animals. We talked about that big winter storm in Mexico in 2002. And I mean, 80% of the population in one storm is, uh, you know, beyond the pale, just uh, unbelievably devastating. So uh, that's why this work is so important. And again, I'm looking very forward to sharing all that uh, resources and, and info with all our groups after the fact. We're going to go to Ms. Dewar uh, joining us in... Uh, Harrison, Ontario, and if you have a question for us to, to wrap us up, so to speak, go for it. Um, I just was hoping that I could get that link for the, what are the top 10 action things? Yes, I'll send that to you the moment we're done. So I'd be able to share with you. Yeah. Okay, Perfect. and then I was just going to, um, that tropical milkweed that you were talking about, what, what is, like, do they plant that? Do we get it in Canada or is it something that's more in the state? What was your middle line? We, we heard, do we get it in Canada? Oh, Jen, you're really delayed. That's okay. Yeah, Type it to me. Type the question to me. I'll ask another question. Tropical milkweed. Oh, the tropical milkweed. Perfect. Yeah, yeah that. Yeah, the tropical milkweed. I, yeah. I think. I think that's been flagged as a as an issue, especially around the Gulf of Mexico and the United States. That's where we tend. That's where a lot of the observations of 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 monarchs breeding later than they should is is coming from. Um, but. I've seen it available in, in uh, nurseries and greenhouses here. I don't know exactly I, how well it survives here, but I, I think it is available. And my, my recommendation is just uh, when you're talking to the greenhouses and nurseries, just ask for the native, the common milkweed is your best bet, butterfly weed in Ontario. Um, if you're in Canada, please go to the Canadian Wildlife Federation uh, website to look for great examples of native milkweed species for your individual province. And if uh, you're in the US or Canada for that matter, check out the Xerces Society. So X-E-R-C-E-S. Um, you can Google them and nectar plants that uh, monarchs use. And they've put together some incredible resources by different regions that apply to both Canada and the US for what uh, great nectarine plants there are out there for monarchs. Fantastic. Greg, uh, we've highlighted so many great resources that you can do in Canada and the States. One last thing I want to harp on before we go is you talked about going down to Mexico, uh, exploring this, how valuable an experience that was for you personally and for the conservation efforts down there. Um, it's something I got a chance to do in January. It's something that I'd always wanted to do my whole life is go to Cerro Pallone. So can you explain to people who might be reluctant to go down to Mexico how easy, safe and, and you know, sort of an effective way that tool this is for butterfly conservation? Yeah, sure. Thanks for the question, Jesse. Um, so absolutely, that's that's like completely correct. There's a lot of so I I would I would recommend that everybody follows their own government's um, travel advisories. They're there for a reason. But that being said, and this is me talking as as Greg Mitchell, um, you know the the father. Um, I would in a heartbeat take my children, um, I have three young children all under the age of eight um, right now, I, I would take them in a heartbeat down to visit the wintering colonies. Um, I felt completely safe um, both times I was down here. Now, both of the colonies I went to were in the state of uh, Mexico, um, but in the areas around these colonies, it's such an important part of the economy that my my feeling is is that it's it's very safe, especially the, the colonies that I, I went to, and um, and uh, I think it's Michoacan. I, I would I would go there with my family as well. Personally, I would I would do that. And the reason it's so important 
is because these colonies are all located on what it's a it's a different type of land ownership system that they have down in Mexico. Um, so it's kind of community owned land. It's not like a private citizen, but it, it's community owned land. And uh, prior to the Monarch Butterfly Reserve being established and, and formally in, as, a, as a United uh, Nations um, Natural Heritage Site in 2008, um, the communities that lived in those areas were able to legally um, harvest uh, wood from those forests. And so they would, that was an important source of income from them was uh, the logging activities. And since uh, it's become a butterfly reserve, uh, they're no longer allowed in, in the reserve to um, uh, carry out forestry practices. Um, there's some salvage logging and stuff, but uh, for the most part, they can't. And so what, um, why it's important for, for people to support, and I couldn't believe how um, affordable it was, to be honest, um, when I was down there, but what, why it's important is because these, these people, these communities that are trying to protect the monarch butterfly, they've lost an important source of income. And there's, there's some subsidy for them through a government program, a World, Life, World Wildlife Fund program, but us going there and buying some souvenirs and paying the admission it really does help these people and it encourages them um, to continue to steward and, and conserve the monarchs. And it really, I think for me, it really, um, it reinforces uh, their commitment to, to those activities. Fantastic. I, I love when we can highlight, you know, sustainable community-based, uh, really impactful ecotourism. And uh, in general, this has been a really fantastic presentation. The feedback's been tremendous. You've got a lot of new fans, Greg, uh, mm -hmm. online. And so uh, I look forward to our live groups for everyone on YouTube to sharing even more of the resources that Greg uh, highlighted. You can check out this video. It will live on YouTube forever. Um, and so with that, diving into another session on Pacific bats. So I'll have okay. to let you go for now, but have a wonderful rest of your day. And thanks so much, Greg, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. Take care. All right. Have a nice day, everyone. Bye.